This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. To fall into a global recession once looks unfortunate. To do so twice looks like carelessness. And particularly to do so because somebody has been just a little bit too free with their spending, well, that's provoked what in diplomatic circles was called a full and frank discussion at the G20 meeting in Cannes. It was, the meeting was organised to try and arrange some sort of bailout package for Greece and also work out what to do with Italy. But it's provoked questions about the role of the G20 and how to ensure that the IMF has got enough cash to ensure that if there is a future crisis, then it's available. Well, international finance is a forte of Professor Faraboz Mashirian from the Australian School of Business. So, Faraboz, I've really got to ask, what's your initial takeout from the G20 meeting in Cannes? Well, the expectations were quite high prior to this uh, summit, uh, but unfortunately the actual summit was associated with uh, fairly uh, substantial bad news from Greece with the concept of referendum and of course the possibility of again default by Greece. And so by the time the G20 summit uh, concluded, we didn't see anything substantial which could assist the global economy to move forward with more confidence uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, and yeah, there are questions as to what the G20 can actually do. I think uh, we know that uh, the emergence of G20 as opposed to G7 or G8 uh, has been a positive step. The fact that we have got Brazil, China, India, Russia, and a number of other emerging economies part of a global forum, it's a welcoming news. However, when it comes to actual delivery of the policies uh, and agenda items of the G20, we know that the G20 doesn't have executive power. In other words, they are relying on peer review that if, for instance, they make some decisions, they expect member countries will follow. But there is no enforceable mechanism to ensure that number of global policies adopted by the G20 could be legislated at national level and becomes part of law. And for that very reason, we've seen since the London G20 summit, not many substantial issues emerge from uh, the subsequent summits. Uh, and what power do they have to lean on the IMF to make more funds available if indeed the IMF can physically get hold of the cash? I think they are trying to now uh, raise the profile of the IMF as an independent international organization which is more embracing than the past. They're giving more voice, for instance, to countries like China, uh, Brazil, Russia as part of the IMF and of course they are trying to use the IMF as a tool to create some kind of liquidity when the global economy is not going well. Now whether the IMF is going to become uh, more effective in the immediate years, it depends on the pace of change that the G20 summits could generate at national level. Uh, and yet after the meeting, uh, we were told that the G20 was nowhere near consensus in terms of using IMF bailout funds to help in Europe. Is there a moral hazard that now that there's the IMF there, that if countries get into trouble, they can just run along to the IMF and get some cash? Well, uh, we should recall that they have come up with a particular, uh, if you like, uh, uh, instrument uh, called uh, new arrangements to borrow after uh, the global financial crisis. Something about 500 billion extra funding was allocated to emerging economies as a way of making sure that the global economy doesn't go into global recession or global depression, if you like. But with the current crisis in Europe, uh, we didn't end up with any agreement that re the rest of Europe and uh, particularly also outside Europe, countries like Ru Russia or China or Brazil, they are willing to contribute to a fund 
administered by the IMF to rescue, for instance, uh, Eurozone member countries. So it has been decided on a voluntary basis that maybe member countries could contribute to a special fund and that that special fund could be used by the IMF in case we end up with some short-term liquidity crisis. But doesn't that essentially weaken the G20 by having it in a voluntary process? Then that means that countries can just shoot other countries in the foot. After all, look at France and Germany bickering over the three-part package that France had got agreed. And then we had the German Bundesbank who just turned around and said that they weren't going to agree to it. But these countries can just disagree with one another and then nothing's going to happen. Well, I think that is one of the major challenges of our global financial architecture. We don't have an architecture where all member countries could abide by an international rule, if you like, or some specific agreements uh, set up by G20 or any other uh, organization. And therefore, national policies often are ahead of global policies. And for that very reason, we can see that member countries can easily disagree or renege some of the international agreements. And that's the weakness of the current international financial architecture. Then what would you like to see? What would be a better financial architecture? Well, ideally, we need to have a system where once the, for instance, countries like G20, they agree to a specific agenda and they agree with global policy issues, these policies become part of national laws so that there is no regulatory arbitrage. In other words, countries can't renege and say, well, we agree at the international level, but we are not going to implement them at national level. We don't have yet such global mechanism in place to ensure that global interest and global solutions for some of the global problems we're facing could be implemented universally. Uh, and if we look at the implications of what happens when the G20 countries disagree, you only have to look at what's been happening over the past two or three months. We've had a roller coaster ride on the markets, and now pessimism really seems to be overriding optimism. Why is that? Are, are people just throwing up their hands in horror and walking away? Uh, yes, I think people basically are looking for more uh, stability. They are looking for uh, assurance because we're facing not only with financial crisis, we are facing with crisis in confidence. People are looking for leadership. That leadership is not coming from the G20. That leadership is not coming from Eurozone or European Union. And so US economy is in a mess with the debt, obviously, the slow economic growth, and then uncertainty about global financial stability as a result of sovereign debt crisis in Europe, where no one outside Europe is willing to assist. And therefore, people have lost their confidence in economic prosperity. And for that very reason, market tends to be more volatile when everything is going badly. Well, certainly the markets hate uncertainty, but now people are talking about the near certainty of a double-dip recession. And what, what's your opinion? Is that likely? Well, we know that during the Great Depression in 1930s, the U.S. had double-dip. In other words, they went into recession, then they came out of it, and then again they went back again to recession. And there have been some forecasts that, for instance, Eurozone could go into recession in 2012. Whether it is going to be a global recession I'm not sure about it. It's too early to forecast so negatively. Uh, we know that China or Asia hasn't decoupled from the rest of the world. We can't say if there is crisis in Europe or US is not going to affect the Asian economies. But nevertheless, China is doing extremely well. India is doing quite well. Brazil is quite uh, active. And so I think we shouldn't underestimate the strength of emerging economies. Uh, however, the Ernst & Young Item Club, they, they, they frequently come out with economic forecasts and they're now saying that we're at a dangerous junction in the world economy. Can this mean that either we're going to recover or what, what would be the worst alternative? Obviously, I can see where they're coming from because when you see sovereign debt crisis in Europe, you see there is not an immediate resolution to this problem. You see market is constant volatile. It's affecting the economic activities in Eurozone. The forecast is possible recession in 2012. The U.S. economy is not recovering to generate enough jobs to bring unemployment below 9%. Uh, people are pessimistic. I can appreciate that. But are we going to see it's a turning point for a major depression? I don't think at least with the current data we have, we should be that pessimistic at least at the present time. 
But if you look at another takeout from the G20, they were very worried about the implications for inflation and oil prices. Normally, if we see a major downturn in the world economy, then oil prices just slump through the floor, inflation goes with it. On this occasion, then they seem to be holding up very nicely and inflation in some countries is getting pretty rampant. What's going on there? Yes, I think this is a new, uh, if you like, uh, experience for the 21st century where our global economy is too sweet. Why? Because you've got US, Europe almost in recession or doing not well, but also we're seeing China is trying to simply slow down her economic activities because of high inflation, housing bubble. The same thing is happening, obviously, at the moderate rate in India and Russia to some extent, of course, Brazil. So this two-speed economy has created demand for oil. Inflation is high in India. Indian Reserve Bank had to increase interest rate. Chinese, basically, authorities have done the same thing. So that is the characteristics of our uh, global economy, two-speed economy that we are facing right now. Uh, and the IMF say that if a double-dip recession does happen, or at least we ha have a global financial crisis mark too, credit markets are going to be badly hit. And yet interest rates seem to be sort of not as good as they were when the economy was booming, but still doing quite nicely. Why aren't we seeing the credit crunch that we saw three or four years ago? Well, we have to note that if European, they don't take drastic action, uh, banking system in Europe is quite fragile. They have to go with recapitalization. They have to write off some of their bad debt. They have to tackle basically capital adequacy. Otherwise, we might end up with banking crisis in Europe, which could then affect uh, the real economy. There's no question about it. And so one issue is our banking system needs to be sound. At the same time, obviously, interest rate in some parts of the world is high simply because they are trying to manage strong economic activities, despite the fact that we've got problem in Europe and United States. Now, whether the rest of the world is going to decouple from US and Europe, all indications are that is not going to happen. In other words, if we are going to have deep uh, financial crisis, liquidity crisis, banking crisis in Europe. As a result of what we are seeing here, Chinese economy will be affected by uh, what is happening in Europe. And certainly Australia has been benefiting hugely from having a China that uh, just seems to have an insatiable demand for our raw materials. What are the implications for Australia if we do go into global financial crisis, Mark II, and in the worst possible scenario, double-dip recession around the world? Yeah. What we have noted since the uh, global financial crisis 2008-2009, Chinese economy, they are shifting from export-oriented to more domestically, uh, if you like, economy, where demand is more domestically driven. At the same time, we know that China has got something about 3.2 trillion foreign exchange reserves. In other words, if need be, they can recapitalize their banking system. If, they, if need be, they can stimulate the economy. At the moment, they are trying to simply manage high inflation and housing bubble by making sure that infl interest rate is high enough. Other measures like macro prudentials are in place to ensure that there's going to be a soft landing for uh, Chinese economy, 8 to 9% economic growth. That doesn't mean that we need to be alarmed about it in Australia. That means, indeed, it will assist the Reserve Bank in Australia to ensure that our interest rate is not going too high uh, in the medium term, simply because Chinese economy is not in boom. Now, whether financial crisis in Europe or slow economic activity in the U.S. is going to hit Chinese economy is really a matter of wait and see. Given the massive foreign exchange reserves, I would expect if we are taking a worse scenario, China again could come up with massive stimulus package to ensure that domestically they can maintain level of employment and level of demand. So in Australia, we shouldn't be too anxious about what's happening in China. OK, not anxious about China, but in Australia, should we be keeping a very beady eye on what's happening in Europe and what the G20 and the IMF are doing about it? Absolutely, because we are living in a highly interdependent global economy. We can be complacent that China has got massive foreign reserves, so therefore we are going to be fine. If there is going to be a liquidity crisis in Europe, if it's going to be a banking crisis in Europe or United States, we are going to be hit by that. Our banking system could be hit by that. Demand for goods will be hit by that. So we can be complacent, but nevertheless, it's great to be in Asia 
than basically being in Europe or United States at the present time. Professor Farabol's Mashirian from the Australian School of Business, thank you very much. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.